for those of y'all that are in here, open up your Bible to James chapter 2, and I want to talk to you about proper faith today. Proper faith, amen? And as you're turning there, I want to, I want to read a couple things to give you something to think on as we get into this, talking about proper faith. Now, this is going to shock some people when I say this, but as I was reading and meditating on this, these are some things that come to me, and a lot of times when I'm reading and meditating, you know, a lot of times I don't just spend my time, and I, and I want to suggest many of y'all do this also, but don't just spend your time reading through the Word and then shutting it and then getting up going on about your day. Stop and meditate on what you're reading. Sometimes quality is better than quantity. Amen? Quality, what am I talking about when I say quality? Just stopping and meditating on what you're reading about. It's actually better to stop and meditate and think and seek the wisdom of God on a little bit that you're reading than on a whole lot that you're really, you know, you know, you can read your word and not really seek God. Amen. Y'all with me on that. Okay. So as I was just sitting there reading this, I'm, I'm going to open this up and I'm going to say some things that are going to shock you. Okay. But in opening this up, I want everybody to understand that number one, that many demons or demons have the same kind of faith as many people. I didn't say Christians, I said many people. Demons have the same kind of faith as many people. I want to read this. As I was reading these the thoughts that come to me. Demons are not atheist or agnostic. Only humans are. I'm going to show you where demons believe in Jesus. Only humans don't. Okay? Also, uh, they, demons believe in the deity of Christ. They believe Jesus is the Son of God. Demons believe in a, in a place of punishment. In other words, hell. Only people don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. Only people don't believe there's a hell. But you, demons believe there's a hell. And demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. All right, let's go on here. Demons believe in a place of punishment or hell. Demons also recognize Jesus will judge them one day. Only man lives a life where they don't think they'll ever have to face Christ as judge one day. But demons know they're going to face him as judge one day. Demons will even submit to the power of his word. <laughs> Yeah, demons will even submit to the power of his word. Humans will not. One major difference, and I wrote this down, one major difference between demons and humans is that demons don't live with a false sense of security that they will be in heaven one day. They know. And I'm going to show you this in the Word of God. All right? So let me read this to you again. Demons are neither atheists nor agnostic. Demons believe in the existence of God. Only people say they don't believe, which is really no such thing as an atheist because Psalms 14.1 says only a fool says in his heart there is no God. All right? So that was the first one. They believe in the deity of Christ. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. People don't, but demons do. Demons believe in a place called hell, a place of punishment. People don't, but demons do. Demons recognize Jesus as judge. If they'll stand before him and be judged one day. Demons don't. I mean, people don't, but demons do. Demons will even submit to the power of the word. And the major difference is that demons know what they are. They know that they're going to be judged one day and bound to eternal torment. Only humans don't believe that. Demons believe there's a hell. In many churches today, I teach you there is no hell. Amen. So I'm going to talk to you about a proper type of faith today. Amen. Father, I thank you, Lord, and I bless you for your word. Lord God, I pray that you give me the ability by the power of your spirit and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to minister this word in a way that's easily understandable. And I pray, Father God, that not only the power would be upon me to minister it, but the power would be upon the people under the sound of my voice to receive it. I pray, Father God, that the word would go forth and do exactly what you said it would do in your word, that it shall perform what you sent it to do, and it shall not return unto you void. I pray, Father God, that this word would go forth and be a sword and a spirit today. 
And I pray, Father God, that blind eyes would be open, deaf ears would be open, hearts would be broken, revelation and wisdom and the spirit of might and counsel would come in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, let's go to Revelation, I mean, not Revelation, it's James chapter 2. I'm going to start out reading in verse 14. What doth, it, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it have not works, is dead being alone. Yea, yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you, I will show you my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will they know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Let's go back to James chapter 2, 14. What does it profit a man, my brother, though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, you got to understand the way that James is asking this question. He's asking this question, and he's setting the people up in order, hopefully, that they give him the negative response. You see what I'm saying? In other words, if he's setting them up. He's kind of setting them up in a way to give them the answer that he wants, to give, that he wants them to give him. So when you look at this, it says, what does it profit, my brother? And so the way that James is asking the question, it should be a negative answer. There should be, the answer should be, it profits him nothing. Amen? The, the answer should be, it's no good. So when James asks this question, he's saying right here, he's saying, what does it profit, my brethren? What does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he have faith, but not works. So the answer should be, there's no profit to it at all. All right? There's no, he's saying, what good is it for a man to say that he's got faith, but he doesn't have any works evidence of that faith that he proclaims to have? Amen. And we see this so many times with people today, people that say they have faith, people that say they're born again, people that say they love Jesus, people that say that they got a relationship with Jesus, but there's no evidence in the lifestyle that they live of there being any true faith in Christ whatsoever. Amen. So what, what James is saying here, he says, what does it profit a man? What good does it bring to a man to say that he has faith, but he has absolutely no evidence of that faith, no fruit of that faith, nothing going along with that faith that he says he has? He says, what does it profit that man? And he's setting it up in a way to where the people should say, that makes sense. Shouldn't profit him nothing. What does it profit you to say you got a car, but you really don't have a car? You got, you're, 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 you're saying you got, I know you, you name it, claim it, people out there, okay? Speak it into existence, okay, yeah, well, all right, let's see. You go get a job and buy one. That's how you overcome that, amen? But speak it in, so you pray, yeah, we trust God, amen? We believe God, but faith without, he's saying right here, he's saying, you say you got faith. You say you love God. You say you believe in God. But there's no evidence of that faith, of faith according to you being obedient to the Word of God. Because the Word of God says, if you love me, you'll obey me. The obedience is the fruit of the faith. Amen? So if there's no obedience, then what you got to get down to is your faith is no different than the faith of demons. And I'm going to show you this in just a second, okay? So he's saying, what does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he has faith and have not works, works prove the evidence of real faith. Okay? Works prove your evidence. Now, works don't save you, but works are evidence of your real faith. Amen? And many people think that Paul and James contradict one another here, but they don't. Paul is simply teaching that you can't earn your salvation by works, and James is teaching that once you're saved, your works will prove it. Big difference there. Y'all got that? Amen? Amen? You can't earn it by works because you got you to understand that Paul was teaching a people that thought because they come from the Jewish, because they were from a certain tribe, and because they've been circumcised, that that's what saved them. And Paul's saying, no, it's not your works that save you. Amen? 
It's not your works. It's faith and faith alone. Romans chapter 4, faith and faith alone. What was it? Abraham believed and therefore it was accounted unto him as righteous. And then when Abraham believed and it was accounted unto him as righteous because his works were evident of that when God said, I want you to take the only son up to the mountain. I want you to sacrifice him. Amen. So the obedience, amen, was evidence of the faith that he had in God. Why was that the evidence of the faith that he had in God? Because on the way up the mountain, he said, even if he does, he knew that God had the power and the ability to raise Isaac back from the dead. How do we know that? Because on the, <clears throat> excuse me, because on the way up the mountain, he said, y'all stay down here while me and the son go worship and we'll be back down. We'll be back down. So what they do, they stay down there. So uh, uh, Abraham's faith in God was so great that he was willing to go up there. Why? Because he went up there. Why? Because God said so. Because it was counted, he, he believed in God. Therefore, it's accounted unto him as righteousness. Amen. And the work, the evidence proven that he believed, we even read it in the uh, Hebrews 11, is he believed God, therefore it's accounted unto him as righteous. Therefore, in Genesis chapter 22, when God says, go sacrifice your son, he is completely confident that God is going to raise that son back up from the dead or provide a substitution before it happens. Completely confident. Amen. So this is the evidence of faith. So this is why James is saying right here, and James gets into that later. But James is saying, hey, he said, if you say you got faith, all right, but there's nothing. What's that faith established in? What is it established in? So let's look at it. What does it profit, my brethren? In other words, he's saying, what is the benefit to you? Listen, church. What is the benefit to you of saying you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but you have no evidence of it in the way that you live? How is this heaven that we talk about going to profit you? How is this spirit that we talk about going to profit you? What is the profit? What is the benefit of you saying you've got a relationship with Jesus Christ, but no corresponding actions? What is the profit of that? What is the benefit of that? And what he's doing is he's, he's trying to get the people to think where their response should be. Nothing. And why should the response be nothing? Because he's breaking down their false belief system and trying to get them to the place of saying that it's not just a mere confession that saves me, but along with that confession should be some works, some obedience to go with it. So he's trying to get them to the place of understanding that my confession profits me nothing without a lifestyle of conviction that leads to obedience. Does that make sense to you? Amen. So he says, what does it profit, my brother, though a man say he have faith? How many of us, don't point at anybody in here because we know everybody in here is saved, right? Ain't no liars up in here. Amen. It says, so what does it profit a man to say? Now listen, and how many times do we hear this? What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith? And here goes that Word that is going to cause some religious people to flip out of their seats. It's not a curse word. It's not a slang word. This word right here in the church will freak people out more than just a good old southern cussing. You know what that word is? Works. Works will cause folks to, uh, right now, even though the word of God, oh, he's talking works. I am. James done it first. Amen. So he says, what does it profit you to say you got a relationship with God, to say you're a Christian, to say you're a follower, to say you believe in Jesus? What does it profit you to say it, but you have absolutely no zero corresponding works to go with it? So the answer should be none. So now we've got to think about what is the profit? What if not the prophet, not P-R-O-P-H, but P-R-O-F. What is the profit of being a Christian? What is the benefit of being a Christian? A changed lifestyle, which is heaven. So he's saying, if you say you got this relationship, if you say you believe, but you have no works, then what makes you think you're going to be a partaker of the benefits? What do you think you what makes you think you're going to be a partaker of the profit, the gain? Okay, does that make sense? All right. So he says, what does it profit, my brother, though a man say he have faith and have not works? They should have been saying right there, zero. 
It don't profit me none. And then the next word he says, just boom. Can, then can faith save them? See, that's a messed up question almost right there, isn't it? So if you break this down, what does it profit? Okay, what is the benefit, my brothers? Though a man says he has faith. We ever run into people like that? Me and, me and Jesus, we got our own little special deal worked out. No, you don't. You ain't, listen, you're a sinner headed to hell. You have no power to negotiate. Amen? There is no negotiation there. Yeah. It's like when you're sitting in jail, say, I want to speak to my attorney. You need an advocate. His name's Jesus. Amen? We all need him, right? So he says, though a man say he has faith and have not works. He says he has faith, but he has no, no actions that line up with the word of God. Can faith save him? What's the answer to that? Now, this scripture written under the unction of the Holy Ghost, all scripture is given, what? By unction of who? The Holy Ghost. This right here is going to, listen, it's not those of us that believe in corresponding actions that are religious. It's those that believe that our life doesn't have to line up with the Word of God and they've created another God in their mind. It's a different Jesus. It's a different gospel. And it's a different spirit. And... And they will call this religious. They will call this works. Okay? So the question is, can faith alone save him? Well, wait a minute. Paul said we're saved by what? What, what in the world? Was the Holy Ghost confused? Not at all. Yeah, we are saved by faith through what? But here's what he's saying. That faith without corresponding actions, was not a true faith of Christ. You can have faith in a lot of stuff. Demons, and this is what he's going to tie it into. Demons believe. And we got a lot of church folk running around that their faith is no different than the faith of a demon. And this is what James is talking about. I'm going to show it to you. All right? All right, y'all ready? Here we go. Does this make sense so far? If a brother or sister be naked and dead. Now, th 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 he's using this as an example, okay? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. In other words, if you and I see somebody in need. Uh, if you and I see somebody in need. If you and I see one of our brothers or one of our sisters. And let me let you in on a secret. It's not just a brother or a sister. They Listen, people don't have to be saved in order for you to help them. Okay? Now, we do want to take care of those of the household of faith, especially according to the Word of God in the book of Galatians. But we are not just to turn a blind eye on those that are not saved. Amen? Because Jesus helped all those that wasn't saved. As a matter of fact, until Jesus got here, matter of fact, let me put it to you this way. Everybody that Jesus helped was not saved. Right? That's, my, that's mind-blowing right there. What? We thought we was all worthy of being helped out by Jesus because we done something good enough. No. Amen. So let's look here. And he says, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, if they be in need, if you see a need that they have, he says, if you see that, we as brothers and sisters, to the best of our ability, we are to help them. This is one of the evidences of faith. And it's not just in this right here, but it's in so many other areas that you and I as believers can operate in kindness and show our faith that we have in Christ. Maybe it's by sponsoring a child. You, you see what I'm saying? Maybe, maybe it's by teaming up with somebody and saying, hey, I only got 15 bucks. Let's team up. Let's get this done. You see, I mean, just, just what I'm using that as an example because it's here today, but whatever it may be. Amen? Because you and I, you've got to understand that you and I, we have all got a part to play in the, we're not an island, we're a part of a body. And together, we fulfill the will of God. Because you may be a part that I'm not, you may be a part that I'm not, you may be a part that I'm not, you're a part that I'm not, but together, we have all been placed in the body of Christ in order to fulfill the calling of the head of the church, whom is Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Where's my amen partner? Where was that at? Praise God. I like that amen. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, now listen to this, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Brother, I'm going to pray for you. Now, what in the world do we do when we're out on the streets doing street ministry and everybody that walks up to you wants a $20 bill? I flip it on them. The night I was there Jason and Scott a couple weeks ago, a guy walked up to me and goes, hey, man, can you spot me a 20? I said, you give me a 20? Well, what makes you think I got 20? I said, what makes you think I do? I flip it on them right there. I said, what do you think? He said, I didn't walk out here to pop. He said, you, and he asked me, he said, you don't bring no money out here? I said, no. He said, why? I said, because when I tell you that I don't have no money, I'm not lying to you. I don't have no money. Now, do you take debit cards? <laughs> now, if y'all start seeing people whip out credit cards, but matter of fact, we do. <laughs> got them little deals they slide in their phone now, like Tracy's got at the barbershop over there. <laughs> Amen. But no, you can't, you can't help absolutely everybody. You know what I'm saying? But, but we're still not allowed that to jade us to help those of our brothers and sisters and people that may not be our brothers and sisters in need. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? You got to be led by the Spirit also. Amen? So let's look here. Uh, so let's, let's, let's take that out of the equation for right now, all right? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of uh, daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, this is nothing more than an empty profession, having a form of godliness. And really what it is, it's a cop-out. It's a religious look that is a cop-out for you not doing what you have the ability to do. Now, let me flip that around. Now, if you're standing there and you don't have the ability to help somebody and you're going to pray for them, what did Peter and John do when they walked up to the guy sitting at the gate, beautiful? And he said, hell, that is bucking. He shook it and they said, silver and gold we don't have. But what I do have, I give unto you free. And they reached out and grabbed him and yanked him up and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Yeah. Boom, and he got up and walked. Amen. Now, if you don't have nothing to get, I mean, you still pray for the people. But if you've got the ability to help somebody, this is what he's saying. That if you're a person of faith and you've got the ability to help somebody out and you don't, he said, this is an example of what I'm talking about, that your faith is empty. Now, it don't have to be just in this area, but it can be in many areas, all right? If you got the ability to defend those uh, uh, that, are, that, are, that are weaker than you are and you don't do it, all right? If you got the ability, if you see a child being abused and you do nothing about it, you say, oh, I'm going to pray for you. If you see a woman being abused, you say, oh, I'm going to pray for you. You see what I'm saying? So he's saying that, that, that your faith without works, he says, that's no different than going out to somebody and having the ability to help them. He says, you say you believe in Jesus. You say you're a follower of Christ, yet you don't do what he says. He says, how in the world, if you walk up to somebody that's in need and you don't help them, how is that going to help that person when, when you just walk off and you got the ability to help them? Say, like, well, I'm just going to pray for them. Have you really done anything? Have you really done anything to help that person? The answer is no. Well, if you say you got a relationship with Jesus Christ, Christ, and you offer him no obedience, do you really got a relationship with Jesus Christ? You see how he's tying the two together there? Okay. He said, no. Matter of fact, he goes on like this, and this is what he says about it. He says, if you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not the things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? He's saying, what benefit is it to them? So he's saying, here's that word again, profit, Ronnie. So he opens up by saying, listen, if you say you're a man of faith, but you have no fruit, you have no works to go, what does that profit you? It's not going to profit you anything. Why? Because there's nothing there. There's nothing there. And then he says, so if this person comes up to you and needs help and you don't give them the help that they need, then how does it profit them? See, in the same way that what you have even though you've got the ability to help them, it's not going to benefit them a lick. And when you don't have faith with works, it ain't going to benefit you a lick either. Faith without works. Does that make sense to everybody? Amen? 
All right. So he goes on here and he says, even so faith, if it have not works, it's dead. And dead faith is no living faith at all. Faith is not dead. Amen. Faith is alive. Faith is alive. Faith is not dead. Matter of fact, the only way that you can please God, there's only one way that you can please God, and that's with faith. That's it. Abraham believed that's faith, and it was accounted unto him as what? Righteousness. The Bible tells us very, very clearly that, that, that the only way that we can please God is by faith. And what is faith? Faith is believing him, taking him at face value of what he says in this word right here. Faith is believing his word, even though it may challenge you, even though it may cause you to go, whoa, 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 that's big. Faith goes through when fear stands up. Amen? Because sometimes, I'll be honest with you folks, if fear didn't show up, there'd be no need for faith. Amen? You ever heard those saying, fear knocked and faith answered? So let's look here. He says, even so, faith if it hath not works, it's dead. You know what he's saying? He's saying, if you say you have faith and you have no works, your faith is useless. Wow. So if your faith is nothing more than you sitting around the house praying, if your faith is nothing more then you sitting around the house and praying that everybody else will go what you need to be doing because that's why you're praying for it because the Lord's laid it on your heart, but you don't want to do it. So you're praying that everybody else go and do it. Amen. Faith, he says, faith's out works. And I'm not saying everybody got to go out, but, but what is it that, that God's moving? And then I'm saying that, that, that the obedience to the word of God I'm not saying everybody go out and minister. I'm not saying everybody go to Ronnie's school and preach. I'm not saying everybody go to Derek's school and preach. Everybody go on the streets and preach. I'm saying, but there is something that your faith is going to move you to do. And this is what it's going to be. Obedience to the word of God. And ministering the gospel is that obedience to the word of God. It may be in your schools. It may be in the store. It may be to kids. It may be on the streets. It may be at the people at your work. Whatever it is, but hidden faith is no faith at all. So he says, now faith without works, faith without obedience, faith without evidence of who you are, he says it's completely useless. It's dead. So if people around you don't know you're a Christian, it's because your faith is dead. It's useless. And why is it useless? Because it's not impacting their life at all. That's hard, but that's true. Me and Clover, we was at a, at a place this, uh, this uh, weekend for Bethany's birthday, and these people, man, awesome place. If you ever, I don't know the name of it, but you get a chance to go, go. It's, it's in Boyd. I mean, it's, like a, it's almost like a Garden of Eden in the backyard. I mean, just beautiful place and they've worked on this place and 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 i mean they got a big old pond back there that they cut out it's got a high dive in it and pretty blue water and a swimming pool and hot tubs and i mean just i mean just a beautiful place you just a uh, uh, place to sit under an i mean just all kinds of stuff just it took bethany and some of her friends out there for a birthday and just sitting there and, and these people were the nicest people that i mean the nicest people that you could ever talk to of course, we paid them a chunk of money, too. But they were nice. They were, you could tell they were just nice people, you know. So I'm sitting there, and, 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 and the conversation's going on. And, man, I start, I start steering it toward the Lord. I said, man, I just told him. I said, hey, man, I'm just somebody that loves the Lord. How about you? And he was like. <laughs> you know, I just went in talking about the Lord and sharing my testimony and sharing this. And, sharing, and I could tell that. That there was kind of a desire to want to talk about the things of God, but there was kind of the, this guy's kind of over the top too. You know, I mean, this guy's. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, wherever it may take me a minute to kind of, it may take me a minute to size you up, but you finna get tagged with the Holy Ghost. You may take me a minute to size you up, figure out where everything is, and looking at you, but it ain't gonna be long before we're gonna be talking about Jesus. Amen. 
So I'm looking at this guy. Well, anyway, I don't know why I went off on that story. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, it's dead. Now, listen to this. Being alone. Listen to that. Faith without works is dead. It means it's useless. It's useless. It has no life. Being alone. This type of faith brings no results and does not lead to salvation. No true faith fails to produce fruit or works. In this case, helping the poor, but in other many areas, in many other areas also. So listen to what he's saying. I mean, you just tie this together. What does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he has faith, but no works. What's the profit you sit there and say you've got faith, but you keep on shacking up and you won't repent from adultery, fornication, sexual sin? What does it profit you to say you have faith, but you won't repent from drug addiction, alcoholism? What does it profit you to say you have faith, but we won't be obedient to the word of God? What? And, and, and there's so many areas. What does it profit? And here's the answer. What is the benefit to you? Nothing. That place that he said he went to prepare for you, it's not for you. That's hard, isn't it? But this is truth, church. People dying and going to hell by 150,000 a day, and you want me to sugarcoat this in order to make us feel better about the mess that we're in and the places we're hanging around? God forbid. You want me to sugarcoat this because you got your friend here today that slipped, Kevin, can you kind of ease up a little bit today? No. If you bring in somebody new and I've never seen them, let it be known. I'm going to turn it up that day. <laughs> <laughs> just, in, just in case, amen. <laughs> I ain't bringing my friend, Pastor. Well, then you ain't saved either. I ain't bringing my friend. Kevin may hurt it. I ain't worried about your buddy now. I'm worried about you. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being alone. This type of faith does nothing. This type of faith don't minister the gospel. This type of faith don't help anybody. This type of faith don't reach out. This type of faith is all about me and self-preservation and not like Jesus giving up my reputation but worried about what I'm going to look like. Amen? Amen? I'm telling you, man, there's going to be a lot of nice, good folk, a lot of non-cussing, non-drinking, non-smoking, non-dipping, non-fornicating people going to bust the gates of hell wide open. Because what you hadn't realized is what you've done is you've put faith in your works instead of allowing faith in Christ to change your works. Does that make sense to everybody? Amen? All right, let's go. Yes, yeah, everybody say, yay. yay. A man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. In other words, he's saying, you might say you got faith, and I got works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Listen, faith is invisible until it's accompanied by works. Does that make sense to you? Faith is invisible until it's accompanied by works. Listen, I could stay in my closet all day praying and nobody ever see me. Nobody even know who I am. But what kind of faith is that? Amen. I'm just using that as an example. I'm not saying we don't pray. Yes, pray. All right. Jesus said, go in your closet and pray. But he didn't say move in there. <laughs> he didn't say camp out there. Amen. Matter of fact, he said, like he said, pray in your secret place so that you can be rewarded where? In the open place. Amen. We got people called to think they just called me. I'm just called to prayer. I'm called to. No, you're not. You're called to pray. You're called to intercede, but that's not all. Amen. We're all called to pray. All right. Now, let's look here. He says, yeah, though a man say, I have faith, I have not works. Show me thy faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, faith is, faith is invisible, but when accompanied by works, that same faith becomes visible. That makes sense to you. So when you're going out, if you have faith, 
That's like I tell people all the time, I don't want people to find out at my funeral that I was born again. You ever been at a funeral? And somebody say they gave their life to Jesus at 12, and you're like, no way. How did I not know that? Well, let me tell you how you did not know it. <laughs> you ever heard that? Yeah, all night. Well, Ronnie gave his life to Jesus when he was two and a half years old. Well, not a lot changed then. He's a little heathen then. He still acts like that today. He still acts like a full-grown two-year-old today. Go to a funeral. Somebody that gave her life to Jesus when he was three years old. Gave his life to him. And then I've heard preachers stand up and say, well, you know, when you give your life to Jesus, your works don't, don't dictate your relationship of whether you go to heaven or not. I said, oh, Lord. I said, please tell me which Bible you're reading because I want it. <laughs> That's easy. I mean, I've actually heard preachers say that, that, well, you know, if you're born again and saved, that what you do on this earth don't matter if it don't, don't affect whether you go to heaven or not. Then how does what I do affect keeping me out of heaven? If the Bible says that adulterers, fornicators, drunkards, and all that stuff shall not inherit the kingdom of God, how can you say that what I do don't affect whether I go to heaven or not? All right, all right, I'm going to go, because this really ain't where I was going to get. Right? Thou believest that there is one. Now, here's where I wanted to get. You believe that there's one God, and you do well. Now, listen, the devils also believe and tremble. Many demons and people have the same kind of faith. Demons believe in God. Jesus, or James is, is saying profession of faith without actually obeying God, is as worthless as the belief of demons. That's hard. Why would he throw that in there right there if that's not what he's comparing? Then why did he put it there? He's saying, faith without works is dead. He's saying, you say you got faith? You say I got works? He says, you show, you show me your faith, and I'll show you my faith by my works. He says, listen. He says, now he's saying, y'all ain't no different than the demons. He's saying, the demons say that they believe, but they have no accompanying good works that go with it. Your faith ain't no different than the demons. And we look around this world, church, and we look around everywhere that we're at, and so many people saying they got faith, so many people popping dope, so many people getting high, so many people getting drunk, don't want nothing to do with God, don't want nothing to do with obedience to God. And when somebody comes and talks to them like this, you say, oh, you're mean, you're unloving, you're unkind. And James is sitting here saying, no, your faith ain't no different than how the demons believe. No, let's go on here. Demons are not, I'm, I put this note to get down again. Demon, demons are not atheists, only humans. Now listen, demons believe that Jesus is the son of God. Only humans don't. Let's go to uh, Mark chapter 3. Demons believe that Jesus is the son of God. Listen. Mark chapter 3, verse 11. And an unclean spirit... When they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. Wow. Listen, there's people actually out there that believe that if they just believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then that means they're saved. And what James is saying here is he's saying, Listen, even the demons believe. Even the demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, we just heard him say it right here. Thou art the Son of God. And there's many people that are running around, and they think that their confession without no obedience, they think that they're going to get to live a life here on this earth of fulfilling the lust of the flesh and the desires of the flesh. And as long as they say that Jesus is the Son of God, that God's going to turn a blind eye to their lifestyle. And he says, no, that faith is no different than the faith of demons. And demons ain't going to be saved. And neither are you. Y'all quit looking at me in that tone of voice. Let 
Amen. All right, let's go here. And he says, and an unclean spirit, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, Thou art the Son of God. Look, the, even the unclean spirits knew to get, pros, get, get down, get, get, pros, get down in a, in a place of worship. Well, I was trying to think prostate or prostrate. <laughs> I was going to my mind. <laughs> I was, I was, I was in a spiritual battle, y'all, and y'all laughing at me. You should have been praying. <laughs> y'all seen it going through there, didn't you? <laughs> That's why you started laughing. I knew why. <laughs> All right, let's go here. And he says, now let's go. Demons believe in hell, and then they believe that they're going to be judged and be there one day. Go to Luke with me real quick. Luke 8, 31. Let's check this out. And I'm just hitting these verses. We're going to finish up in Mark 5. And they besought him that he would not command them to go unto, go out into the deep. You look at that deep, that word the deep there, that's the abyss. So now check this out. Demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Did we just show that in Scripture? Demons believe that there's a place of torment, there's a place of punishment. Because they just said, hey, 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 don't send us into the abyss. You see that? Where does people... Where does lack of believing in hell exist? Not with the demons. Not with the angels. It's only right here on earth. So I'm going to throw this out there, and this is going to boop. I'm going to put it out there. For somebody to say they believe in Jesus, but don't believe that a good, loving God would send people to hell, they ain't got as much faith as a demon. Well, y'all sleeping on that one? For somebody to say they believe in Jesus, they believe in God, and then to say stuff like, but a loving God wouldn't send anybody to hell, they don't have as much faith as a demon. Because even the demons believe there's a God, and they believe that they're going to be thrown into the abyss, thrown into hell. So to my Jehovah's Witness out there, Jacoby, where yet? Jacoby's not a Jehovah's Witness, but <laughs> but that but that guy that, that was it a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon come to the house that day? Jehovah's Witness, and he come out there, man. Jack, th this one word jacked his doctrine all up. He goes, Kevin. He goes, Do you believe that a loving God, like the God that we serve, would be right? in throwing somebody into eternal torment forever and ever into hell? I said, yeah. That was all I said. Yeah. About like that, wasn't it, Jacoby? I was like, yeah. And blew, that just blew his whole theology up. I mean, whatever it was, it wasn't theology. Blew his whole dog, pfft, shattered him right there. And then when I started quoting scriptures, that really jacked him up. I said, wait a minute. How do you say you believe in the same God that I believe in, but you call him a liar when I read the word to you? <laughs> Go back to his watch tower. Yeah, I need to build it a little taller. <laughs> so we see here that demons, what? They believe Jesus is the Son of God. They believe in hell. Now let's go over to Mark 5. We'll finish this up with some fun right here. Y'all with me so far? So what are we learning in here today? The people that walk around saying they got faith, but I don't believe Jesus sent anybody to hell. I don't believe fornication is wrong. I believe they, 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 they're calling him a liar. All right? So really what we're finding out is that actually demons believe the word more than he does. And that's why it's so easy for people. That's why demons are sitting back licking their chops and getting people deceived because they know how easily deceived people are. Yeah. Yeah. Judging God. That's true. All right. Let's go on here. Let's go to Matthew. I mean, Mark chapter five. We ready? Verse one. And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now, what is an unclean spirit? That doesn't mean he just worked hard that day and hadn't washed his feet. Uh, that means that this man, an unclean spirit, this is a demon. Okay? A demon. All right? And this man was bound by several demons. Couldn't get loose. All right? I'm going to show you all a couple things here. 
Uh, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now, we got to look and we got to see what is it that's drawing this man and these unclean spirits to Christ. It could be one of a couple things. Number one, it could be a desire that this man has to be free from these demons that he has no ability to be free from himself. Or it could be the demons recognizing authority and power showing up and them having to bow down to him because every knee will bow. Or it could be a mixture of both there. Okay? But let's look here. All right? And he says, he says, and when he had come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dealing among the tombs. Isn't it amazing how, pe hey, how dead people don't want to be around live people? So you wonder why none of your friends want to be at church. Because they feel a lot, they feel a lot more comfortable amongst the dead. See, because dead people don't see what needs to be changed. Dead people don't see what needs to ha happen. Dead people don't see what needs to take place. Dead people ain't going to lay hands on you. Dead people ain't going to pray for you. Dead people ain't going to say, come here and let me talk to you. Dead people are not going to show you the word of God. Dead people are just going to lay there and let you walk through life however you want. Okay? And he goes on and he says, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man can bind, could bind him, not even with chains. No man. Turn, i got to go back to this church. Listen. Dead people don't want nothing to do with people that are alive. I'm not talking about dead people in a cemetery. Y'all right? Y'all with me, right? Dead people want nothing to do with the Word of God. Dead people want nothing to do with conversations about God. Dead people want nothing to do with prayer. Dead people want nothing to do with the study of the Word of God. Dead people do nothing more than go through the religious motions but have absolutely zero desire to get to know God on a personal level themselves. Dead people. And unfortunately, that is much, much, much of the church today. All right. And he says... Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters, chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out, cutting himself with stones. Now listen, I made these notes, and I was meditating on this. The goal of demons is to destroy God's image in a person. All right? So let me tell you something. Young people, all of you, young people, every one of you, the stuff that's going around with these kids and stuff that are cutting themselves with knives and bleeding and, and putting slashes and stuff on their arm, don't think that's just because they're depressed, or just because they got home troubles. Yes, it is because of that, but it is a demonic influence. Nowhere in the Word of God do we see a child filled up with the Holy Ghost that is carving on themselves. But right here we see a man that is possessed by demons that is pulling out stones and cutting on themselves. Why? Because the job of demons is to destroy the image and the idea of who God is. We see it also where they were cutting their swords when Elijah called fire down out of heaven. So this garbage of this going on and you parents just sitting there thinking it's going on. No, for me and my house today, here's what's going to happen. The cutting stops today for me and my house. Me and my house. And if you in my house, then we're going to serve the Lord. I don't care if I got to throw every knife out of the house, every razor blade out of the house. And if I got to lay down on your bed with you at night, it stops today in the name of Jesus. Well, that's law. You show sure right. I'm going to hold you. I'm going to hug you. And I'm going to bind you up to keep you from hurting yourself until that law brings you to Jesus Christ and he sets you free. You idiots that sit back there, out there in the world, and just let people harm themselves and let people hurt themselves. 
That was a strong word, wasn't it? Yes. And we sit there and we try to explain it away. You can't counsel a demon. You can't medicate a demon. You got to cast it out. And we're doing nothing more today than when people are being influenced by demonic powers, sending them to a counselor that's got a degree and has no belief in the power of God at all. No power. And we're too. Yeah, that makes me mad. And it should anger some people in the body of Christ. People carving on themselves. Kids cutting their arms. And I'm supposed to just say, Kevin, that was a little harsh. No, let me tell you what's harsh. When they take a knife and they dig it into their arm, they lay their flesh open because they're in such torment. That's harsh. I go to places. I see people when I'm checking out of stores, Ronnie, and their arms look like a zipper. They reach up there to do the cash register. You look over and their arms is where they carved on it, carved on it, carved on it, carved on it. And when we see that, every one of us have got an opportunity to let our works be known right there. Reaching out to that, 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 that girl or that, 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 that young man, and it's mostly young women that you see doing it. And reaching out to that young girl and grabbing a hold of her and saying, man, what's going on there? I want to tell you something. And I've had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to minister the gospel just by seeing scars on somebody's arm and being willing to open my mouth up and say, I want you to understand something, that the power of Jesus will set you free. That's not God that wants you to carve on yourself that way. That's not the love of God. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus will set you free right now, today in this house. But what most of us do, turn a blind eye, we walk away, dead face. Dead face. And you know what? I've been guilty myself. I'm a pretty bold guy. There have been times I've walked away from things I should have never walked away from. What do we do? We say, Lord, give me another opportunity. Give me another opportunity. Amen. All right, let me go on here. And always, night and day, he was in the mountain. So the goal of demons is to destroy the image of God in a person. Demons isolate, they're strong, and they're self-destructive. What they do, they isolated this man. They had him away from everything else. They had him away from any life. They had him over in the tombs. They had him where all the dead people were. That's what demons want to do. You ever notice how stuff gets up inside your head? Why does nobody at church like you? Why does nobody at church do this? Why nobody at that? And you start isolating. You start believing that mess. And people start fading away. And then they've got a whole scenario of the things that they've thought up in their head to justify why they're doing what they're doing. And then you find out about it, and you're like, what? That never crossed my mind. Listen. Church, we don't have to talk about people. Our head does it enough. About us. All right, let me go. And he says, and always at night, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. There's a lot here, but that's not what I'm preaching on right now. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. So there's one of two things going on here. Either Either the demons were submitting or there was a desire within the man to be free. Or both. Demons got to submit to Jesus. Amen. There is no other name under heaven. Amen. He says, I've given you power and I've given you authority to do what? Cast out demons. Amen. So there's one of two things going on here. Either the demons took complete control over this man to where he had absolutely no self-will at all anymore. And they went and bowed down because they knew they had to bow down to Jesus, a greater one than them. 
or there was still a desire in this man, Tony, to be free. And it was kind of, one of the two, either way, they came to Jesus. But these demons, I want people to grab a hold of something. That these demons, they were breaking chains when people would come out there. I mean, this is weird to me. Because these demons were so strong that men would come out there and put chains on them and tie them to the tombs. And then these demons would break the chains. But yet they couldn't get away from the men that were doing it. We, not, we all know how to submit just long enough to get done what we want to get done. Y'all get that? We all know just how to lay low long enough to get by. Then when everybody else is gone, the true power of them demons show up. Start busting chains. That makes sense to you? We all know how to put on the face at church. Amen. We all know how to do all that stuff. Amen. We all know how to be at church. We all know how to go through. Amen. But it seems like sometimes we get out of here, the power of the struggle, man, that stuff is so strong. Amen. I can just see this guy, men come to him with chains. I mean, this guy, these demons had the power to break these chains. So the only way that these guys could put these chains on, Derek, was they, 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 these, this man had to let them. These demons had to let them. You see what I'm saying? I mean, if they had the power to break chains, Ronnie, don't tell me that they didn't have the power to get away from these men. So why was that even? I mean, if they could break chains, they could rip his arm off and beat him with it. So what is going on here? I mean, if you had that kind of strength to break chains, would you just willingly let somebody tie you up and, and bind you up and put br bracelets on you and all that? No, I don't think, I don't know. But the only thing I can figure out is that these demons or whatever it was would just, I don't know exactly why. But here's what I know. When nobody else was around, after the chains were put on and everybody was gone, that's when the torment really started. That's when the screaming, the yelling, the breaking, the chains, the cutting, and all that stuff really started. And why do I say that's when the cutting and all that stuff really started? Because if they had been cutting while the men were there, they'd probably been cutting them men. Right? So something was going on here that when these men, when people were around, there was a sense of not peace, but just cal calmer. But then when they wasn't around, these demons went to talking. These demons went to getting in their head. These demons went to went to say, cut yourself. These demons went to saying, grab that stone, grab this, cut yourself, go do this, go talk, go call this person. One more hit, one more this, one more that. All of a sudden, when people wasn't around, all of a sudden their power started manifesting all of a sudden when there wasn't nobody around. All right, let's go. But when he saw Jesus far off, he ran and worshiped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. See, even demons know that Christ, that they're going to be tormented one day. They're going to be destroyed one day. And he goes on and he says, in chapter, uh, next verse, and he says, Oh, for he said unto them, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, he said, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, which is about 6,000, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now, there was there nigh under the mount. And he goes through and he talks about the pigs. And y'all know that Jesus sent him into the pigs. I'm not going to go into all that, but let's jump down to verse 17. And they, be, they began to pray for him to depart out of their coast. In other words, they wanted, they wanted Jesus to leave. They, 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 this guy that's been screaming, howling, doing all this stuff, that he's such a disturbance, they come and chain him up. Church, listen to this. They come. This guy is howling. People are telling stories. He's howling. He's screaming. He's breaking chains. And I mean, you can, I mean, just think about this. If you're the man that got to go tie this guy up and you're the one that just tied him up yesterday and you walk up there and this dude's naked, bleeding, cut up, and he's holding on to the chains that he's done, broke, and he's ripped them apart. And you're the one that's fit to have to go wrestle this joker back down to the ground. Listen, y'all might know, I've, I've, been in some, I've been in some situations before. And sometimes you look at people and you're like, I ain't excited about jumping on that one right there. 
because you know you better bring your lunch because you're going to be there a minute. Just that simple. So I can see these guys going out. You got to get this picture in your head. This dude's bleeding, hair messed up, cut up, bleeding, naked, chains hanging off his ankles and off his wrists from where you just put him on there the other day, and he's done busted them and broke them loose, slobbering at the mouth. You've been hearing him all night howling like a werewolf, all this stuff going on. And then your buddy say, hey, let's go tie that guy. Nah. All right? So then all this stuff's going on, Sean, and then Jesus comes up and casts them out. Pigs run down the hill and drown themselves. Unclean pigs, which goes to show that Jesus didn't let them go into a clean animal. He only let them go into an unclean animal. Why? Because this guy was a Gentile, and by the Jews, they already thought he was unclean anyway. They run down there, and then this is it. This is what happens. They want to get rid of Jesus. They want to get rid of Jesus. Get him out of town. Get him out of here. Get him gone. He's causing too much. That man screaming and yelling all night wasn't near as bad as what they thought Jesus was, the one that set him free. And it's still no different today. The people are still today that would rather stay in the same mess in the same place they're at. Amen? Stay in the same thing. And he says, we'll get more into that later, not today. And when he came to the ship, he had, been, he had been possessed with the devil and prayed him that he might be with him. How be it Jesus suffered him, but saith unto him, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and have compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. Faith and works. Faith and works. So what we see, we'll wrap this up. Number one, James said it like this. He said, you say you got faith, but you don't have no works. He said, your faith is dead. He says, number two, he says, you, you bump your lips about all this faith that you got. You talk about it. You're bumping your lips about all this faith that you got. He says, listen, you're telling me about it, but it's useless. Your faith is useless. Why? Because it don't have any accompanying works that go with it. There's no evidence to go with it. And he says, as a matter of fact, he says, the demons are like you. He says, the demons believe, but they're not going to be saved. The demons say they believe in the, that Jesus is the Son of God. The demons say, don't throw me into the abyss. The demons say, don't torment me. And the demons know that they're going to be judged by Christ. He says, you believe that too, but you have no works to go along with it. He said, you ain't no different than they are. He says, because demons have no obedience to God, but they got a confession. See, demons, a lot of people have no obedience to God, but they got a confession. He says, you're no different than the demon. A confession with no work, with no obedience. So this is what he's saying. What is that confession going to profit you? It's going to profit you the same thing that it profits the demons, which is eternal torment. Y'all get that? But this is what it will profit you. So God ain't going, when we're standing before God one day, he ain't going to say, well, Lord, I just, I, 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 I couldn't get it done. I, I just, I, I tried, Lord. I tried, Lord. And he said, I didn't ask you to get it done. I asked you to let my son work in you. But the very proof of you not allowing my son to work in you was you kept trying to fix yourself. But what ends up happening? We see at the end this man that hated people, cutting and hurting himself breaking chains, fighting, screaming, yelling. Then when these demons met the master, hallelujah. 
when these demons met the master. Listen, listen, church. Even the demons came and worshipped. There's only one place worship don't exist. That's with humans. Right now. The demons had to go bow and worship. They had to submit to the power of Christ. Lord, don't torment us right now. Let us go over here. Let us go into the pigs. Just don't, don't send us into the abyss. Don't torment us right now. He said, get up. He cast the demons out of that man. That man got set free. And the only thing he wanted to do was be with Jesus after that. He said, please let me go with you. Please let me go. See, I've never known anybody that got touched by Jesus that didn't want to be with Jesus. You ain't hearing me, church. The evidence of what he happened was he come to Jesus and he said, let me go with you. Let me walk with you. Don't leave me here. Let me walk beside you. Let me be with you. Let me go with you. I want to be around you all the time. And then we say, people, they got a relationship with Jesus. Huh? They don't want to be with him. He said, no. He said, I'm going to be with you. He said, I'm going to tell people what happened. That's what you want me to do? You mean I can't go with you right now, but the next best thing is you want me to go tell people what you've done? Next best thing, you want me to go shout it from the rooftop. Next best thing, you want me to go what? Tell people what I've done. And the Bible says that he went all through that place telling people about what Jesus had done and how God had set him free. Where's that in us? Where's that desire to those of us that say we're born again to want to be with Jesus like this man wanted to be right here? So he ran down and said, no, 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 no. I want to go with you. I want to go with you. Jesus had to kick him away. He said, get away. Go tell people about me. Is that what you want me to do? There was no arguing. There was no saying, no, Jesus, I would, but. There was no saying, Jesus, I would, but. Who's going to believe me? There was no saying, Jesus, I would go tell them, but you know how I used to be. Them men used to come over here and tie me up. They used to beat me up. You don't know what I've been through in this community. I need to go find a new place. He said, no, go tell them. And Jesus went about, or that man went about everywhere in there telling them about Jesus. And what happened? People believed him. So what do we have here? We got a lost man. That was truly touched by Jesus. And the evidence of his touch was he wanted to be with him. But like these people walk around today saying, I'm born again, saved, and have no desire to be with Christ. No desire to be obedient. No desire to fulfill what he told them to do. And I believe that is what James is saying. When you have no desire. And you may disagree with this all day long, but I'm going to stay. Because you know what? This scares me because I'll be 100% honest with you. Sometimes I see this in myself. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I'm not as excited about this guy to get into the Word. But I can't be led by my emotions. I can't be led by what I feel. Amen? I got to be led by, you know what, this is. Because you've never been obedient to anything until you've done something that you don't want to do. Amen? Obedience, it's easy. And obedience that only benefits you is not obedience at all. The Bible says that Jesus was obedient unto what? Death. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he wasn't looking forward to that. He said, Lord, if this cup can be taken from me, take it. But not my will, but your will be done. Stand up, church. I'm done. I hope this message uh, helps us today about proper faith. Confession is nothing more than a confession. Bless you, John. Confession is nothing more than a confession. But a confession that is accompanied by works. And he departed. 
and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him and he was nigh unto the sea and behold, there come one of the rulers. So he goes on and what did this guy do? The evidence that something happened to him was in two places. Number one, he wasn't cutting and being tormented and howling and being having the chains, having to be tied to the tombs all day. See, here's what we do today. Somebody's got something like that going on, we medicate them. And here's what we do. We think since they're medicated, Ronnie, they're okay. As long, here, and here, as, long as we get them to shut up and calm down, then they're okay. So you medicate them. But there's still no change in Christ. There's still no change. We just got a person that many, many times these medications turn them into somebody that feels absolutely nothing good nor bad. Excited about nothing. Nothing. And that's what society says is fixed. This is how we say this is how we say you're fixed. If you're not screaming, yelling, breaking in, doing all this stuff, we can get you medicated enough where you just then we fix you. And it's a sad place to be. So Lord, we thank you. Lord, I believe I preached exactly what you laid on my heart today. I ask, Lord, that you take that seed and you water it to make it grow. Lord God, if there's anybody in this room among us, if you are not born again and saved, if today something convicted you, and your relationship with God is nothing more than a confession, and you know it's dead. And here's the sad thing. You would rather die. You would rather die even with the question on the inside of you saying, you know your relationship with me ain't real, but you would rather die where you're at than take a chance on somebody knowing that your relationship with God ain't real. You ain't no different than the man that was tied to the tombs. You're tied up by the same chains of bondage. You've been coming to church. You've been doing all this stuff. And for me to say that my relationship with God is nothing more than going to church and a confession that I have, but I know on the inside of me I'm not growing as a Christian. I know on the inside of me I'm not bearing any fruit. I know that. I know when Pastor Kevin ain't around, the conversations are still the same. Everything's still the same way. I know that on the... But instead of anybody knowing this, because i got to self-preserve, I got a reputation I got to uphold. I'm going to go back to my lackluster relationship with God. No prayer, no seeking, no crying out, no change. That's what I'm going to say. And if that's you, if that's going on, listen to me. I say it again, those same chains tied this man to the tomb. The same chains is keeping you tied to that death. And the only way that you're going to be set free is like this man did right here. He ran to Jesus. He ran to Jesus. He cried out. He said, Lord, be free. And if you do that, I believe today Jesus Christ will set you free. Bow our head, let's close our eyes.